We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Hello everyone, greetings. Thank you so much for joining us today for our workshop, workshop session, Digital Health Blueprints uh, for a post-pandemic board. Uh, we are very, uh, I'm very honored to be moderating this session with our honorable guests. Um, we are discussing today a lot of issues concerning digital health and how to create an important link between right to health and this new technologies in new ways to explore <clears throat> digital health. So uh, not taking very long, I'm gonna uh, start with our first questions. We're gonna work in three rounds in this workshop, two questions that I'm gonna share with our guests and then um, a third round for questions from the audience. I'd like to start and I'll be presenting our participants uh, when I make the question uh, with a simple question. Which change COVID-19 has brought in terms of digital health at national level in a very concrete perspective? I'm gonna start inviting Anita Gurumurthy to answer this question. So Anita is a founding member and executive director of it for change where she leads research on information society studies with a focus on governance, democracy, and gender justice. She also directs it for change Field Resources Center that works with grassroots communities on technology for social change models. Anita recently completed a multi-country research project on e-government and gender equality in the Asia Pacific in collaboration with United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asian the Pacific. So Anita, over to you. Thank you for being here today. Yeah, thanks so much, uh, Matthews. I think uh, what are the changes that COVID-19 has brought in terms of digital health at national level? Of course, I think the world over, uh, the pandemic really changed the way in which uh, governments look at data and governments look at surveillance and citizens look at data and surveillance. Uh, but of course, one important thing that has been written about, which is important to place on the table is the dearth of data capacity in the public health system. In my country, particularly, we just, uh, at the height of the pandemic, access to digitized information about the public health system, such as the number of hospital beds, disease incidents, uh, death tolls, all of this kind of information that would have been invaluable to make decisions about how to uh, uh, ration hospital resources, testing facilities, all of this data was not available to policymakers. There was lack of transparency as well, but uh, the problem actually goes into the backend data backbone, you know, which is uh, simply not existent. And instead, we actually saw this predictable turn towards, you know, real time geolocated data and contact tracing, quarantine monitoring, etc. And this is actually problematic, right? So at one point, in fact, there were 62 apps launched by a host of agencies, all uncoordinated and no integration at all a lot of wasted resources and effort, some very good citizen-led initiatives, but those were in pockets. And the central government's app that was collecting a lot of personal data and without any purpose limitation, without any um, boundedness, uh, you know, was really a cause for uh, great concern, alarm. Uh, but this was not just restricted to my country, I think, but it was also, for instance, um, this uh, scholarship, there have been media reports in the EU about the disproportionate and arbitrary surveillance that kind of emerged during the pandemic, because even existing instruments and advisories and guidelines, including the GDPR's guidance uh, on, you know, how to use uh, geolocated data, uh, really does not uh, elaborate the proportionality of the limitation of the right to privacy in light of the implementation of contact tracing. And so what really has not received attention is how investment in public data infrastructure underpinning health systems can happen, especially in highly resource constrained environments. Um, the policy debate has now shifted with great urgency, you know, with a massive uh, 
um, you know, uh, imagination of the national health data ecosystem. It's called the National Digital Health Ecosystem, the NDHE, and it's intended to serve as the holistic interoperable digital public infrastructure for public and private innovation to provide the essential techno building blocks, that is the aggregated, anonymized, uh, non-personal health data sharing mechanisms and APIs for the development of health service apps and solutions. So very, very solutionistic approach and plagued by a number of shortfalls. So let me quickly end my input by saying that there are at least three to four significant shortfalls here that we should actually be very alert to lack of clarity on safeguards to ensure consent validity in the sharing of health records. You know, how do you share health records? What is informed consent? Secondly, lack of safeguards for harms incurred in data processing, downstream data processing in this kind of solutionism. Thirdly, no mechanisms to prevent the capture of health data value in these public-private partnerships, which are supposed to rescue public health, you know, the uh, and to use a shorthand, the type of risks we have seen in big partnerships between the NHS and the UK with big tech companies. And finally, uh, among many other different problems, the risks of exclusions that could arise in health services because of the mandatoriness of the health ID, which is programmed into the national digital health infrastructure. So the adoption of the health ID, if it's tied together with citizen health records, then you have a situation where citizen medical histories are stored in a manner that becomes you know, visible to the system and also to insurance companies. So that creates a certain market for predatory data practices. And without a personal data protection law or a non-personal data regulatory system, you know, it's really uh, the devil and the deep sea predicament. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Anita, for your input. Now I'm going to follow with our next panelist. I'm going to ask Barbara the same question concerning national change uh, at the pandemic on digital health. So Barbara is a professor and head of department at the Department of Political Science at the University of Vienna, where she also, she also directs the Center for Study on Contempor of Contemporary Solidarity and the interdisciplinary research platform Governance of Digital Practice. Her work explores the social, ethical, and regulatory dimensions of genetic and data-driven practices and technologies in biomedicine and forensics. Barbara is currently a member of the National Bioethics Commission in Austria and a member of the European Group on Ethics of Science and New Technologies advising the European Commission. So Barbara, thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you very much. And um, um, building upon um, the, the great diagnosis that Anita has already presented, um, many of the, the, the aspects that Anita mentioned um, also feature in the Austrian healthcare system. The configuration of the Austrian healthcare system is specific in that, of course, it's a it's a very privileged situation. It's a rich country. It's um, a one of the highest performing healthcare systems, um, and also the most inclusive. Um, and prior to COVID, it was surprisingly undigital. Um, so almost everything was focused on um, personal um, face to face contact. Uh, for example, physicians, doctors did not, um, could not uh, do any consultations over the phone or over digital platforms because in order to get reimbursed, they actually had to see the patients. Prescriptions were filled in person. So it's a very interesting combination of, of, of a system in a, in a rich, highly, highly technological country um, whose healthcare system, especially in, in at this um, um, interface of patients and the healthcare system was not digital at all. So that has changed um, very rapidly during COVID. Um, so telemedicine has received a push. It has been a catalyst um, also for uh, different uh, reimbursement rules. So non-face-to-face -face, um, uh, consultations can be reimbursed, prescript prescriptions, can be filled digitally. There's, however, um, and this also speaks to an, an, a topic that Anita already mentioned, um, there's a, a great um, hesitancy 
in Austria and a great skepticism of, um, of sharing, or making personal data available and the central storage and analysis of, of personal data. Um, that, that level of skepticism is higher than in other comparable countries. And the reasons for that are manifold. And I think this plays out, first of all, in, in, a, um, in a number of people opting out of the electronic health records due to concerns of over surveillance. And also it became, um, it became pertinent now during the COVID era when it came to um, um, COVID uh, contact tracing apps. So the idea that many people who didn't, did not download the apps they didn't do so because they were concerned about over surveillance. And the point that I want to end with here in this round is that these concerns are not necessarily concerns about individual privacy only. So very often when people voice those concerns, um, they, they frame these concerns in terms of um, systemic societal aspects. So the question is much more what kind of society do we want to be and live in, and not so much how can I protect my own data. So the, the, the notion of public value, will other people benefit, will other patients benefit, is crucially important. And I'll stop here for now. Thank you very much, Barbara, for our input. Now I'm going to ask our next panelist, Jung Ho Jung. Uh, Junho is a researcher at the Center for Health and Social Change, a nonprofit community based research center uh, specializing in transdisciplinary research on health issues. He's leading the project in critically analyzing digitalization of health in Korea. So, Junho, thank you very much. Over to you. Thanks very much, Matthias. And thanks, Anita and Barbara, for uh, laying out the baseline for our discussion. Uh, I guess I'll be discussing a little bit more narrowed or detailed examples of what's happening in Korea at the moment. So in February 2021, uh, 2021 Korean Ministry of Health uh, launched a web app called My Healthway. The app is supposed to be designed to establish the sovereignty of personal medical data, they argue. So we're currently providing uh, medical checkup data and prescription data and vaccination history, uh, which is collected by national health insurance records. Uh, and by 2020 and 2023, they're hoping to collect all the health, uh, medical health records in EMR system, uh, regardless is public or private uh, medical institution, and also collecting data from wearable, med wearable medical devices and integrating into single app and providing it to uh, other institutions, uh, patients, and uh, even to the private companies. So this is not only providing patients with an uh, integrated record, but it also uh, they supposed to uh, give full ownership of their health data, uh, giving back to the patients is what is being argued. But what is notable is that Korea's plan for integrating data is not only focused in health sectors, but encompassing the personal financial and administrative uh, information. And uh, my Healthway app is part of the broad My Data Umbrella uh, program happening in Korea. So it was uh, evident in uh, COVID-19 pandemic, the single registration system was quite effective contact tracing, which was highly prized in Korea for effectively con uh, controlling the early outbreak. But ha however, it also raised a sign significant concern over the privacy. And recently passed law in uh, Disease Control Prevention Act uh, allows uh, KCDC to collect data on credit card usage from banks and geolocation information through telecom companies and surveillance camera footage from the police for contact tracing uh, purposes. So this means that people would come into contact with the infected individual could be traced and quarantined almost in real time. Uh, at a certain stage of the pandemic, the Ministry of Health even made the information on the infected individual public, including their means of transportation, names and places they visit, and medical, pla uh, medical institution they visited, so, and also their health status, which uh, uh, raised significant concerns over the, pri over the privacy. Uh, but even though the names and addresses weren't given out, the levels of details 
details in the personal information that was revealed was uh, quite identifiable, uh, leading to discrimination and personal dis distress. So this uh, recent uh, trends in Korea for conglomerating all the health data, including the, including the administrative data and financial data, raises se serious concerns. And uh, I think it does show how uh, government is viewing the health data uh, in the times of COVID and how effective it can be uh, for the control purposes or surveillance purposes at the time. Uh, I'll stop here and I'll discuss a little bit more on the issues of ownership and other issues in a later stage. Thanks. Thank you very much, Juno. Now uh, I'm going to uh, ask Nicoleta Dintico to answer this question as well. So we are discussing which changes COVID-19 pandemic has brought in terms of digital health and national level. So Nicoleta is a journalist and a senior policy analyst in global health and development. After directing MSF in Italy, she played an active role in the MSF campaign on access to essential medicines. She worked as a consultant of the World Health Organization, and she currently leads the global health program for the Society for International Development. Thank you very much, Nicoleta. Over to you. Thank you very much uh, to all, all of you. I'm very glad to be here now because uh, uh, we have only a few minutes. I will start by saying that whatever Barbara said for Austria can be simply, you know, apply, applied to the Italian context because we, I mean, her diagnosis, her analysis of the situation of Austria, the concerns of the uh, Austrian people do very uh, closely resemble the concerns, uh, the preoccupations that. Uh, Italy's uh, society, Italian society also had uh, from the very beginning when they set up this uh, special contact tracing app. Only 12% of the population actually, you know, uh, downloaded it and then it failed very, very soon because of mistrust, because uh, we were looking at Korea, in fact, saying that we, yeah, they may be effective, but we don't want to go into that direction. And uh, uh, so for, for all the caveats of the app, it did not convince people. Now, uh, notwithstanding all these uh, conditions of uh, very scarce literacy uh, from on, on the side of the population, but also on the side of the health personnel, because there, there is a lot of training to be carried out. Now, with the um, national plan for recovery and resilience that has been agreed upon uh, within the EU, European Union, uh, Italy, which is the, I, I, I guess we can say the major uh, bene you know, beneficiary of this plan, will invest an enormous amount of uh, uh, money into digitalization. Uh, because, uh, a precise, and especially for health, uh, digitalization seen as a kind of a panacea of the poor health infrastructures that we did have in the past. And, and, and actually digitalization being seen as the only approach, only strategy which can ensure tracing, contact, surveillance, and proximity. The good thing, I mean, the, the interesting thing uh, that uh, the plan, the National Plan for Recovery and Resilience has, uh, has, has carried out when it comes to healthcare is actually uh, filling all this narrative with very soothing words, uh, talking about proximity, networks of proximity, you know, this uh, kind of uh, house of community, they don't, are no longer called hospitals. So this, this uh, uh, um, trying to really semantically cajole people into buying the new product for which a lot of money is going to be uh, invested uh, and for which there is, uh, uh, as I said, a, a situation of departure which is uh, rather um, uh, rather difficult uh, and uh, an attitude of the population that has uh, uh, increased in hesitancy precisely after with all this kind of vaccine stories. I mean, the, the digital hesitancy is actually combining itself with the vaccine hesitancy that creates, a, and this creates a, a lot of uh, complications. Of course, there are, and I finish, there are a lot of big question marks because Italy is divided up in 21 regions and there will be 21 different systems. So interoperability is going to be a huge problem. Technical capacity, I said already, lack of knowledge by the population and there, how do you convince an elderly population 
to get into this. But uh, this is really the scenario on which uh, uh, th there seems to be a kind of a discrepancy be between uh, uh, what the government wants to do and what the society is ready to accept. I'll stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Nicoleta. I guess, as we can see, there are many is common issues, different countries, but common issues. And this is probably what which has moved the organizations that have proposed this workshop uh, to bring this discussion. Important to remember, this workshop uh, was proposed by Medicus Mundi International, the People's Health Movement, Society for International Development, and IT for Change. So a group of different civil society organizations moving together to bring this important discussion. And uh, thinking of that, I'd like to get back to you, our panelists, and ask you uh, after all your valuable inputs, uh, from your perspective, uh, what a global digital health framework for realizing right to health should include. If you could highlight some key message on that, it would be really important. So please, uh, I would uh, follow in the same order. Anita, if you could start. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I'll keep it short. Uh, it's, um, I think it just shows that there is a lot of room to um, not just discuss this, but really launch some kind of a voice of uh, conscience uh, in terms of the framing of the issue at a global level from this perspective that the panel is bringing. I want to point out that in addition to the social value of privacy and what kind of society we want in terms of how data may be alienable or not, uh, I think um, there is some literature but I also think that we do need to understand uh, the concerns uh, of data as a public good and what that would really mean in terms of the value for equitable and universal healthcare that, you know, the, the wealth of knowledge that is locked in data can actually be put to. So there are two questions of value. One is the value question from the point of view of uh, uh, privacy and its social value. The other is the value of uh, social benefit public benefit. So I think that there are, um, uh, you know, there's the individual, there's the collective, and there's the system. And uh, broadly, I see uh, five uh, uh, overarching uh, principles, but there will be several, and there, there are several ways to cut it. And these, I speak from my position of relative ignorance. But I think we need to protect data rights of individuals and communities in health. That's the first principle. And this includes a range of civic liberties and data across the data life cycle, including not just the right to privacy, but the right to know what uses my data is being put to, to put to, which will include informed consent and more in downstream uses. The second principle, I think, and I, uh, I stick to uh, the, the data part of uh, digital rights, global digital rights. The second is deepening the ability of health data systems to deliver equitable health, to enable universal access to quality healthcare. The third uh, principle would be to achieve um, a just distribution of health data value. So not this kind of uh, products and services spin, but a constitutional rights spin, which is that science and innovation basically uses of data and AI should be not based only on market imperatives, such as the clamor for personalized medicine, wellness, uh, you know, perpetual youth and all of those things, but public health imperatives. The fourth is um, to really understand and recognize the collective control of people over their data, including the need for democratic deliberation around the nature and extent of data alienability. I want to point to a few developments that have been taking place um, you know, globally. The recently launched a report of Lancet and Financial Times Commission on Governing Health Futures 2030 calls for a new approach to the collection and use of health data that prioritizes protecting individual rights, promoting the public good potential of data, and building a culture of data justice and equity. But I think to break this down in terms of the individual, the collective, the system, and what equity and justice means in terms of data value. Transform health, which is also uh, something that people in, in this panel may be familiar with, is this global initiative, which works in uh, a coalition towards universal health coverage um, uh, around the SDGs. And this initiative recently released its draft health data governance principles. And to cite from the document, they mention um, you know, front and center the, the concept of data ownership, which is 
which implies that individuals and communities have a right to know, to determine, and to control how their data are used and to benefit equitably from such data. And such rights extend to products and services derived from data and AI and health data systems and their governance, therefore, should be designed based on such data rights and ownership. I think a very significant development in the past couple of months, uh, which is important for, for the public uh, health movement, uh, people's health movement community, is the WHO's Health Data Governance Summit's uh, uh, declarations. Of course, it's it's um, the rhetoric is beautiful, and we really need to see how the, the member states and the world community will actually walk the talk. And what this uh, Health Data Governance Summit's document, outcome document underlines is the need for cooperation and dialogue to secure health data for and as a global public good and align support for identified good practices and principles in health data governance. Uh, I quote, it says, establishing health data as a global public good adhering to international standards and governed by good practices will help build trust to maximize benefits and minimize harms. A data governance framework should support and strengthen individuals and communities to have control over and benefit from their own health data. And it also underlines the role of health data stewardship and accountability mechanisms. So it checks all the, all the boxes. And therefore, I think that here, the caution is uh, twofold, and I'd like to point out both those cautionary frameworks when these principles are actually debated, deliberated, and embraced in terms of what actually happens on the ground. I think we need to take a leaf out of the ongoing debate in the uh, digital, uh, uh, the genomic sequences, the digital information sequence debate. There is a difference, of course, between patient data, electronic medical records, and uh, genome sequences. They are, I'm not meaning to conflate the two at all. We would do well to remember the differences, but there's one important thing, which is this clamor for open access, right? The open access um, uh, framework has become extremely fashionable, especially in, in the genomic sequences during this particular uh, pandemic, uh, also before in the SARS context. But uh, suffice it to say that no sequence that has been taken out of Africa has helped African people ever, right? So something there is failing in spite of the PIP influencer framework at the WHO. And you know, many, of, uh, many times this is motivated by the need for credit in academic, uh, you know, scientific uh, uh, communities. And secondly, to actually strengthen and embolden uh, the big pharma. The second thing we need to take uh, out of uh, what really happened with the genome sequencing debate and really the Nagoya Protocol and the Biodiversity Convention is that we need to ensure somehow that benefit sharing with communities from data is not seen in terms of tangible one-time benefits and monetary benefits alone, but intangible long-term societal benefits rooted in ideals of equity and justice. So I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anita. Very important inputs. Uh, let me also take this opportunity to thank uh, who is uh, sending inputs and questions in the chat. We will try to get back to it in the final of the session. And I welcome you all to send your questions and inputs in the chat. Well, so uh, following our workshop, for you, Barbara, the same question. What a digital health uh, global framework for realize the right to health should include? Um. I'm going to start answering the question by um, emphasizing that the empirical data from many countries all over the world, and here I'm referring to the Your DNA USA study led by Anna Middleton in Cambridge that includes many countries um, and tens of thousands of participants who are asked how they want their data to be used. Not only DNA data, by the way, but also health data and other data. That the empirical data shows that people aren't generally worried about data sharing or digital technologies, but they, as, as, as Anita and Nicoletta and others have um, emphasized, um, it's important for people to have a sense of control. And I, I, I would say that both individual and also collective control is important. 
and a sense, as I mentioned earlier, that it creates value. So um, Anita already mentioned the right to know what my data are being used for. Um, this doesn't need to be necessarily an individual right where people are asked every step of the way, you know, on a, on a sort of weekly basis, um, should we use this for this? Should we use it for that? But it's more, well, Barbara Koenig, the um, bioethicist called it um, consent to being governed. So if there are trust, trustworthy governance frameworks, people who um, other, other people trust will make good decisions on their behalf, then collective governance and collective control can also be very good. Collective control is actually one of my key points that I think should definitely be part of such a framework. So strong institutions and mechanisms for collective responsibility oversight. So, but another important point that was already mentioned is collective control over what the data are used for. And that's the key thing. Um, so what, what many people are, and I think very often rightly concerned about, that their data could be used to limit access to services for people, um, to profile people outside of the stratification that has clinical benefits for patients. Um, so that data, in a way, are used for, as Anita was saying, for uh, to meet market goals or profit goals against the interests of people. And this is why the collective control also over what data are used for is so important. Similarly, nudging. So very often, and we've seen this happen in the COVID pandemic as well, that um, data and information are used to nudge people to make good decisions. And this is uh, very often something that people don't, don't want their data to be used for. But what, what would be a good, way of, of using such data. It would be obviously highly needed, and we've seen some comments um, in the chat to that effect already, to um, save lives, to improve the health of people, um, also to improve you know, in a non-crisis situation or beyond the crisis situation, to improve services in an equitable way. So if we use data to know where um, particular health needs are very prevalent, where particularly health problems are particularly prevalent, um, then I think this is a very good use of data beyond the clinical use in the strict sense of the word. Um, there are also, there's also value in using data to um, support health in all policies. So I think COVID has really driven home that almost every policy field is health policy housing, um, environmental policy, social policy, tax policy, all of that is in, in, in a way also health policy. To, so to, to use data to help us decrease um, social and economic inequities and inequalities and to abolish poverty would actually be the best way to prepare ourselves for the next pandemic. I mean, the, the root cause of much of the suffering beyond the immediate effects of the virus is poverty and inequality. So it is not, a, I think it's not a very far-fetched thing to say that this is what um, health data should be used. And in this way, if they're used in this way, if people see it used in this way, um, there's also very often trust. Um, a similar thing applies to ownership. Um, many people rightly warn of too much emphasis on ownership in connection with data. I think what we would need to we would need to place a caveat to that concern, namely that ownership discussions should fo shouldn't focus on individual ownership. But I think we really need collective public ownership, not only of data but also of infrastructures, the platforms, uh, the software, and so on. So I don't think we want, or at least I would not consider it desirable to have a highly um, digitized and digitalized. Um, healthcare system where a lot of the infrastructures are owned by entities that have no public accountability and whose prime concern is not to increase um, public value. So I think such a, uh, an, an, an alliance for an international, using digital infrastructures and data in an alliance to 
um, globally improve um, healthcare for people and also to think about a right to healthcare should always see data in the service of other and also digital instruments and tools in the service of other greater goods. Um, and as I said earlier, I think the key thing will be to also establish very good instruments with teeth um, to improve collective oversight, collective control, and also, and this is my last point, um, collective harm mitigation, because data use will have great benefits. We've seen that in the pandemic, but there will always be some harms incurred. And at the moment, even with the forms of redress that many um, legal systems pose nowadays with the protections that frameworks such as GDPR pose, there will always be harms that can be occurred without anyone breaking the law, without anyone's nefarious intentions. And I think a society that um, posits it as a matter of solidarity, maybe, for people to share their data needs to have better harm mitigation strategies in place. So if anyone is harmed by data use, it cannot, the owners cannot be on them to prove what exactly happened and what caused the harm. But I think we need to have low threshold mechanisms there um, to support people if they incur, uh, if, if they experience such harm. So it's, it's about collective the rights, collective control, control, collective oversight, and also protecting the interests of people and, and societies. Perfect. Thank you so much, Barbara, for this very valuable contribution. Uh, now I'm moving to Juno. So Juno, the same question from your perspective. Um, what a global framework for digital health should include in order to realize right to health? Uh, thanks, Anita and Barbara, again, for <laughs> providing excellent blueprint. But I guess mine will be more of a question rather than the answers. <laughs> Uh, there's a saying in Korea that we need a new normal uh, in post-pandemic world. And, uh, but as I shown in earlier case in Korea, it seems like we are going back to older uh, normal in this uh, time of the crisis. And sure, the COVID has a huge impact in the digitalization of health. And uh, as Barbara and Anita mentioned, I think essentially the question of digitalization of health uh, boils down to the who owns it and how it should be governed. Uh, in case of Korea, the, as I shown in my health way, it has a mixed response from the public. Uh, as you can imagine, integration of whole, a huge amount of data uh, raises a lot of concerns of the confidentiality, privacy, and also the misuse of data. But uh, the government said that uh, to avoid the criticism over such issues, that they say the My Health Way only act as a platform and highway to transform the health data, uh, and they do not really store any personal health, uh, personal records or personal uh, data in their servers or in their system. And despite their reassurance, government position is that they only act as the highway and transferring the data rather than taking responsibility of such data and how it should be governed. And it really sounds like easy escape from the criticism, criticism and also uh, individualizing the risk rather than socializing it. So it does really raise the questions and what kind, what kind of, uh, who owns this platform and how it should, get, should be governed. And to complicate the matter a bit more, uh, I, there is a mixed feeling in general public. Uh, consumer groups really welcomes these changes and uh, uh, this kind of initiative that each person really have their control and ownership of their health data and sharing of such information uh, between the medical institution and insurance company, in this case, the private insurance company, uh, will really enhance the uh, accessibility and choice of the patient, uh, the customers. Uh, this is uh, the argument that has been raised by the customer groups. But on the other hand, the patient group, especially who has a chronic diseases or cancers, uh, the, the, they argue that simple storage and merging of the health data doesn't really uh, provide, provide or guarantee the autonomy of the patients. 
as you can imagine, health records are a complex data set and giving information, uh, giving info informed consent for access to specific uses may be difficult to understand and implement in the uh, level of the patient's understanding. And furthermore, there are currently no effective measures or sanctions in place to, for its misuse and in uh, secondary uses. The government emphasized the data in my health is not for commercial use, but this will not stop patients from sending their data to private institutions such as large, large hospitals, insurance companies, or even the data mining companies. Uh, later stage in the app, they can patient can really download all their data, and there is no really safeguard for how they are used in uh, secondary usage. And the issue is further entangled by the current legal structure in Korea of the patient data. Although fundamental rights and ownership of the patient data is within the individuals, individual patients, but patient records are produced by hospital and it is really treated as some kind of uh, intellectual property of the doctors and hospitals. And because of the uh, and duty of the safeguard and storage of the records are within the medical institution. And nature of the health data as public good, as already mentioned, shows that there are, there are really multiple networks of interest, uh, which defies the simple solution of how this data is owned and governed. And the sensitivity of health data, especially when it merged with the identifiable data, causes of risk of privacy. The ensuring that app doesn't really have, uh, doesn't simply hand over the ownership of data without uh, sufficient safeguard is as essential at this stage and should not be achieved not only to, through the um, technological, technological means, but by the transparent govern, governments. Without, the, there is, uh, without this, there is a real risk that my health will re, real, uh, cause real harm and, and offset the benefit it might bring. So integration of the personal data, including health data, uh, has gained great momentum during COVID-19 pandemic. There is a sense of urgency and trend, uh, desperation allow the deregulation of the existing framework and weakens many of the governance structure that allow the democratic decision-making and people's participation that was developed uh, before pandemic era. Uh, these were done under the name of public health and rapid response to the crisis. So there is really uh, urge and the push for the speed uh, for this kind of information to be uh, moved. So for example, my healthway was on the way since 2018, but most of its development was made during the COVID-19 pandemic uh, period. Such haste development allows little room for discussion uh, for its development. And during all the stages of the police development and the app development, the committee did not include any patient group or civil society represent representatives. And it was only in only 2021 that during the implementation patient stage of the app when they la really launched that the, there's only on, one patient representative uh, in the committee where other 15 was from gov either from government or from the industry so i think this really shows the impact of covid-19 at the sense of urgency or unprecedented unprecedentedness that the uh, reverse in the government structure we str we struggle to put in place uh, in the previous time and there is real return to the old normal uh, in, in times of the um, new normal in COVID-19 world. So I'll stop here. Thanks. Thank you very much, you know, uh, very important contributions as well. And now over to you, Nicoleta, uh, for the same questions. Thank you very much, Mateus. Uh, well, I will build on uh, the last part of Juno's intervention and uh, thanking like Juno, Barbara and Anita for their extremely uh, good uh, insight and the blueprints for the, 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 the global framework we would like to see. Uh, I would like to really depart from Juno's uh, points because I think uh, this is really the, the, the building block of any framework that we need to build together. Uh, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm also very concerned that, uh, you know, uh, the sense of this kind of emergency regime that has now been surrounding the digitalization 
information drive. I, I tried to explain earlier on the amount of money, the narrative that is uh, uh, supporting digitalization as the solution to most of our problems. If you are not digitalized, you are not, uh, you know, this, this kind of uh, almost idolatric uh, sense of uh, innovation at all cost whatever that is and whatever the outcome is and whatever the process behind this innovation is, is really to me the most worrying element. And uh, we have not, not even in civil society organizations have we really discussed and uh, you know, dived in what the right to health means in a digitalized era. You know, we, we have not, we are only now, thanks to COVID or due to COVID rather, are we starting to, you know, minimally grasp in a, con in a concrete manner, be it through ourselves or, or, or the, the, the first societal debates, uh, the reactions of our societies, what this entails and what it should entail, by the way, because as Duna was saying, civil society organizations are not really involved in this, are they? The, I mean, digitalization, as Parminder always says, uh, is the most uh, multi-stakeholder uh, process uh, that uh, was born in a multi-stakeholder era and does entail the role of the private sector with no kind of rules of the game at all. So this is really, uh, I think, uh, the preliminary conversation that we should, uh, the, the, I think Anita called it the voice of conscience earlier on, that we really need to uh, raise uh, in a very constructive but also determined manner because uh, otherwise in this emergency regime it will not be possible shortly to do anything and and that i think is a is a, is a major is a major concern i i'm also saying i mean on, on top of of the things that you've said, and, and some of which are, uh, would be a repetition from my side, I really would like to raise this the, the urgency of, of this of this discussion and this topic, uh, because as you know, the WHO is discussing a pandemic treaty now, and the pandemic treaty, whatever it, uh, with its final outcome, but the, the original narrative that actually has triggered the pandemic treaty along in one year of very speedy. Uh, negotiation is this idea of sharing, sharing data, sharing pathogen, and everything has, to, I mean, if you look at the documents, it's got to be done quickly, rapidly, and it, it actually has this acceleration culture in it, which, uh, you know, who is monitoring this acceleration and who is driving this acceleration when the risk is that this pandemic treaty uh, is actually constructed a along of all of society approach, which when we say that entails intrinsically the role of the private sector and hardly any civil society entities that are uh, present uh, in the scene. So I, I think uh, we really need to be extremely, um, we, are really, we really need <laughs> to bring the digitalization discourse out of the pandemic uh, uh, discourse, out of the pandemic reasoning and uh, uh, try as civil society organizations, I think, to raise more and more the conversation on these very important and delicate issues at the, uh, in societies uh, with the health to work, health personnel, even health personnel are sometimes, you know, polarized in between ignorance and resistance because of ignorance and this kind of uh, drive that is financially supported and therefore they see themselves that unless and until they enter this world, they will be penalized, that they will not you know, go with their careers. That is the only way forward. And honestly, I think COVID tells us so much more about the future of healthcare and the future of the right to health in a comprehensive, in a comprehensive manner. Um, so I think this, is uh, uh, really um, a, a major issue. Then I think we really need to consider uh, something that uh, applies to products <laughs> and to medicines. You know, the who owns and who controls the intellectual property of an algorithm. I mean, if we now have uh, problems and uh, issues with the IP of something that is trackable, a drug, a vaccine, or whatever. How can we, uh, you know, track the origins and, and the property and the, you know, intellectual ownership of an algorithm? And, and that, this, I think, is something that we really 
need to address very, very seriously. Finally, I would imagine that uh, any framework has to uh, really set a very philosophical as well as technical analysis of biotechnologies. I think, you know, uh, no one is doubting the role that the technology like CRISP can have in uh, uh, servicing the right to health according to the criteria that both Anita and Barbara have designed and which I totally share. However, I think that a serious discourse, which is, as I said, philosophical, is a, is a cultural and the political discourse about the use of biotechnologies for uh, the temptations that are very strongly supported financially by research and innovation in the interest of market and in the interest of uh, you know, uh, speculations around the right to health, uh, have to uh, consider the use of biotechnology Technologies, what type of technologies that we want to uh, you know, promote, to favor, and what is the collective ownership and control and information around these technologies. Because at the end of the day, if we take the constitution of the WHO, health is also knowledge and scientific monitoring and enough instruments to be able to be part of the discussion and be part of the, of the decision-making process. I would stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Nicoleta, for your very important input. Uh, so there's a lot to discuss, as we can see here. Very importantly, we are almost running out of time. Uh, I'm going to start this final round um, with, well, by thanking the people who made us questions and comments in the chat. Very important. And I was trying to extract two issues to hear from you. Um, so. First, the participation of users of uh, healthcare systems, associations of patient, patients and communities in this digitalization process. If we get back to the alma Ata declaration, we have community participation as a key component of right to health. And if you are thinking of right to health to build a framework for digital health, this is an important matter. So I'd like maybe to hear from you on that as well. Uh, I guess there's also a very important question here concerning literacy and access to internet in a more general and social sense. Let me share with you that uh, this week in Brazil, my country, there was a research that showed that about half of the population in Brazil cannot access uh, government programs because they don't have full access to internet because of bad connection or because of issues concerning literacy in internet. So maybe I'd like to hear from you on that as well. And please do feel free to share your final considerations. Let me just finish this uh, final intervention by thank you all uh, for this amazing workshop, our panelists and everyone that is uh, following uh, here at the Zoom call or at YouTube. And thank IGF for the organization. So over to you, Anita, please, for your final considerations. Thanks so much. I just want to make two points, maybe to speak to your uh, second uh, issue. I think both are, uh, for, uh, you know, very different false binaries, and I'll just take uh, less than a minute. The first is often in a context like India, activists have repeatedly said that um, it's it's uh, pretty rich to think about debates on data when the basic health infrastructure is doddering, right? I think that's really a false binary because we'll just simply miss the bus if um, you know we really don't do something now. And that's a very different context uh, from the developed world, where obviously here, you know, this entire triaging has uh, uh, simply left so many uh, people dead that uh, activists are rightly perhaps pointing to um, maybe what they think are elitist issues about, you know, the, the war against um, data privatization. So we really need to cross that bridge. The second, I think, is a very provocative, uh, but important point about uh, which is the theme for another uh, deliberation on intellectual property. I think that the problem will be solved if we invert the, the, the paradigm and say, rather than opening up public data, we do need to open up private data. So the binary that uh, some data can be open and accessible for innovation and other data can be closed and proprietized for uh, intellectual property and accumulation, I think that binary doesn't hold. There has to be a baseline of data about certain things, uh, below which baseline is that line of uh, non-alienability, 
where you can't collect certain kinds of sensitive data, but above that should be a line that is available to everybody so that whether it's public innovation, community innovation or private innovation, that line doesn't really belong to anybody in the sense of perpetual profiteering. I'll stop there. Thank you, Anita. Barbara? Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. So I think this is uh, very, very important to point out this binary, this false dichotomy between um, caring about basic health needs and caring about digital infrastructures. And actually, in many countries, the, the universal basic services movements now include information and communication technology. So I, I thank you, Anita, for highlighting that. Um, at the same time, I would like to, um, as a social scientist, uh, take a look into why this binary emerged, emerged in the first place. Partly it did emerge, this, this false impression of a binary emerged because of the way in which digitized and automated solutions are promoted as an alternative to what I call high touch medicine. So the high tech is sometimes presented as an alternative to high touch. And I think there lies a danger in the sense that um, if, if, we, if we move in a direction of trying to, you know, if we accept that healthcare systems have only a finite amount of resources and the resources are becoming scarcer, which I think we should not accept, by the way, if, we, if, it, if we're serious that health is the, the, the highest good, then of course we, we, we will find money to pay for it that we then don't use for other things. Um, so um, if healthcare systems follow the cost imperative, then there will be a very small margin of elites that will be able to afford human medicine where they still have contact to a human practitioner and other um, parts of the population will, will have to do with automated medicine where symptoms are tracked, diagnosed online in an automated way, where digital technologies replace the face-to-face -face type of medicine that is so valuable. And I think also in, in the spirit of Anita's uh, call, which I fully agree with to break up this binary, we need to say that digital technologies need to be in the service of making available face-to-face high-touch medicine, facilitating high-touch medicine. The expensive stuff is often not the data, it's, it's the human interpretation and the, the human care. So we must make sure that digital medicine does not become a replacement of human medicine. Thank you very much, Barbara. Juno? Yeah, just very, very, uh, briefly uh, following up on the participation, I think we have to be aware of, uh, be careful with the black boxing, the technological issues. And I think as in Korea is shown that uh, often government or company exploiting the technological issues and labeling the committee as the technological issue committee and civil society or part, uh, the patient group often uh, prof by the technological issue is too, too complex for them to participate. And really the issue is with the, the experience and how the governance should be uh, managed. So I, I think uh, opening the black box of the technological issues and don't be prof by it should be an issue uh, with the participation from the civil society and the peoples. Did you know, Nicoleta? Um, just a very final uh, consideration. Let's avoid uh, not only, as Barbara was saying, that uh, digital health becomes, you know, the main strategy substituting uh, the face-to-face -face, uh, uh, health care that uh, we consider very valuable, but also let's have a digitalization help uh, a new conceptualization of health. I mean, let's uh, look at health as it is and not just the medicine. We really need to look at digitalization, supporting the new effort of uh, the One Health approach. When we consider human health and animal health and planetary health, a, a, a one, a one uh, embracing uh, factor, I, I think uh, this is the, the, the only way in which I can see um, that we avoided extreme 
in a hyper individualization of medicine and health, which is a major risk with precision medicine. And we can gain some ground as civil societies because, uh, and as societies at large, because uh, really COVID has done a lot of uh, harm to, to, you know, to the world, but it has also brought uh, so many new, new categories that we need, uh, absolutely we need to redefine the future of health uh, and the future of global health justice. So I think uh, the digitalization can serve the purpose uh, uh, very much and we need to use it fully and be aware out of any binary dichotomy that uh, we have a wonderful opportunity to do this. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we end our workshop. Thank you very much and thanks IGF for the opportunity. Thank you all. Bye -bye. Thank you all. Thank bye -bye. you everyone. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.